<clears throat> Ooh, wait a minute. The words. Right, right, right. Say the words. <clears throat> Klaatu! Mirada! <laughs> The Celestial Code of Scripture are many of the stories we find within the Bible found in the heavens? Do the stars and the constellations tell us the stories that we find within the Bible, but also an ancient Mesopotamian myth? Marduk and the Enuma Elish and all of the different deities in their stories, the flood account, the Garden of Eden, Jonah swallowed by a fish, Samson killing a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass, or even Jesus walking on water. Let me know what you think of this episode. I had a blast as we dive deep into this whole celestial code. Hi, my name is John McHugh. I'm a Utah archaeologist, a licensed Utah archaeologist. Um, I have a specialty in archaeoastronomy, especially as it rates, relates to the Bible and the Quran. Um, I have a reading knowledge of several ancient languages, including Akkadian, Biblical Hebrew, Greek, uh, Quranic Arabic, and um, Ugaritic. And uh, I enjoy trying to expose how some of the myths from the Bible and the Quran uh, appear to have correlates as pictures in the ancient Mesopotamian constellations. Thank you so much, John McHugh, for joining me today. Tell us about this wonderful book and your presentation. Yes, well, um, thank you for having me on, uh, Derek. I love myth vision, and uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan, and I've gotten many other people to join in and become fans of your show. Um, so the book I've written is the product of about 20, almost two decades of research. It's called uh, The Celestial Code of Scripture. And the subtitle is The Astral Cipher Underlying the Miracle Stories of the Bible and, and the Quran. So uh, it, it very, very simply, if you had to, to just say what does the book show what does it what what's the discovery the discovery is that that the the iconic the iconic miracle stories that you uh remember reading from sunday school or from church that you or or from the synagogue or from the mosque um that that you've read in the bible and the quran they they correspond to, to pictures or tableau in the oldest constellation lists from mesopotamia and they're written in you know cuneiform writing um, which is, it's the, uh, in using a stylus to inscribe cuneiform sides, signs on a clay tablet. So it's not like papyrus or anything like that. You're writing in clay. So what the book shows, and I'm just giving you the highlights stories here, but so for instance, like the Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden story, that can be traced to a picture in the ancient Mesopotamian constellation, N Noah's flood and ark. Same thing. There, you, you can see a picture of this story in the ancient night sky. Samson's slaughter of a thousand men with a donkey's jawbone, which, which sounds kind of absurd in a, in a sense. Like, how do you use a jawbone as a weapon to kill a thousand armed men, armed soldiers? Again, there's a picture of it in the stars. Jonah's three-day confinement in, the, in a, the belly of a giant fish in Hebrew and in a sea serpent, serpent in Greek, and I'll go into that in that section. Jesus' virgin birth and Jesus' sea walk, they're both visible as pictures in the ancient Mesopotamian constellations. Um, um, the Islamic claim, like right out of the Quran, it says that the, the, the book itself, the Quran, the recital, uh, was based, is founded on a celestial tablet in heaven. I can show you where that tablet is. And Muhammad's encounter with the angel Gabriel, uh, that's described in the book. So, so um, if I may just move in to talking about, uh, you know, we all know that the 
the Greek constellations we're all pretty much familiar with. You've read about the, the 48 ancient constellations, and anyone who's done any reading about those constellations know that they originated in Mesopotamia. And they were written uh, in the cuneiform text, in these clay tablets, these clay cuneiform tablets. They're typically written in a language called Akkadian, which is it's just Babylonian and Assyrian. Akkadian, the southern dialect is Babylonian. The northern dialect is Assyrian. The older script is Sumerian. And we'll talk about that in a second. But one of the things that's really intriguing and the big difference between the way astronomers and in the modern world and astronomers in the ancient world thought about the sky comes in their own texts. Um, today, Astronomy is a hard science, okay? But in the ancient world, the word astronomer and the word ast astrologer were interchangeable. There was no uh, differentiation until the 6th century AD. And in these ancient cuneiform texts that predate the uh, Old Testament by centuries, um, you hear this reference to the, the starry sky as shittir shemei, which is literally celestial writing. It's heavenly writing. And what's, what's remarkable, you know, we have the term astronomer or astrologer, but in the ancient world, the title of an astronomer or an astrologer was Tupsharu, which is a writer. And you're like, wait a minute, a writer? Why would you call an astronomer a writer? Well, remember, astronomy and astrology is interchangeable. The, the Mesopotamian astrologer was literally reading encrypted messages in this heavenly writing for signs of impending earthly um, events that would uh, befall the kingdom. So the, the king always had an entourage of personal astrologers who would say, hey, there's going to be, an, the, the stars say there's going to be an assassination attempt. The stars say there's going to be uh, bountiful uh, wheat yields so that we can plan on selling a lot of wheat at the end of the, the uh, harvest season, things like that. So the prognostication aspect of astrology, I think everyone comprehends. We all like to read our horoscope. Um, but here's, here's where it starts to get really arcane. There's a lot of evidence in uh, the ancient cuneiform text that, um, that Babylonian astrologers perceived the constellations as literally, I, I call them still frames, snapshots, pictures, of just momentous earthly events that, that had taken place in primordial times often. Um, the actual term they use is Lamashi. They call it Lamashi writing or literally constellation writing. And that, that's what the premise of the book is. So I have it right there for you. Like, so you can, the, the, the viewers can read along with the, the text, like pictures in the constellations framed monumental historic events and wordplay in the constellations can either form titles and part of the action and details taking place in each still frame. So, so picture, how about you have a still frame in the constellations, and then you have the titles of the constellations that make up that picture. And those cuneiform titles are divulging the action and details that are occurring in the picture. And that, that may seem really complicated complex when you think about it uh, in English. But let me just turn to this picture. This is a sketch from the Farnese Star Atlas, which is second century. And you look at it there, you see Pegasus, you see Andromeda, you see Perseus carrying the head of Medusa. That's literally a sketch from the Farnese Star Atlas. They are literally snapshots of primordial events that were believed to have taken place on Earth. Every Greek believed that was absolutely true, inviolably true. Sorry. I like the word inviolable because you just can't, you can't question it. It's so true. You wouldn't even question it. Um, so yeah, Perseus did cut off Medusa's head. And yes, Pegasus did spring forth there. How did you know that? There's a picture of it in the stars. So the second part of Omashi writing, which is the idea that wordplay can divulges revelation or divulges epiphanies. We don't get that today. Um, the main reason is wordplay is considered a kind of witticism or, or, or a kind of humor. Like when you, you see comedians all the time use wordplay, you know, to be funny. 
Um, we don't really understand today the solemnity of wordplay in the ancient world, especially in Mesopotamia. But I, I want to, you know, reframe it for our readers, you know, as someone who was raised devoutly Catholic, right? You, you can read in, in Matthew's gospel, Jesus says, and I also say to you that you are rock, you know, you're Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church. So the Roman Catholic Church has based the papal office on a wordplay on Peter's name. Just imagine the, the, the reverence with which that was done. Like today, we would never pick a president because there, a wordplay in their name said, you know, great leader or something like that. We would just never do that. But in the ancient world, it was very common. Uh, so I just wanted to give you a, a biblical example that everyone's pretty familiar with. Yeah, interesting. Now, so, you know, and I'll get to the pictures and everything, but I, th this is really the meat of what you got to understand. Because then when I get into the pictures and the word plays, you won't understand it if you don't understand these two basic topics, which is in ancient cuneiform writing, all of the diviners, including the astrologers, use this term. They call, they call it a matnitirti, and it literally means hidden words or some variation of uh, tu sha'ili, which is, you know, the secrets of the gods. So hidden words are the secrets of the gods. And in fact, when an ancient astrologer found a pun, they often added, you know, the prescription. This is a secret of the great gods. The uninitiated shall not see this. You cannot share this with someone who is not a professional astrologer. This is, this could be spiritually dangerous. And so in essence, word wordplay divulged divine revelations to the astrologers who were reading the starry sky as if it were a pictographic text. You know, think of, of a children's picture book, in essence. Um, so you might say, well, how did, you know, cuneiform writing, how did all these puns start showing up in cuneiform writing? So the fancy term for it, and the scholars use is polysemy. It's a really nice word because it just means multiple meanings in a word or phrase. You know, if I say, you know, a bear, I saw a bear in the woods, or she's going to bear a child. That's a form of polysemy, two different meanings on a, on, on a word. Um, so it shows up so pervasively in cuneiform writing because of the way cuneiform writing evolved. So cuneiform writing is invented around, it's the earliest writing system. It's invented around 3000 BC by the Sumerians, and they use it to write their Sumerian, you know, their Sumerian language. And in the latter part of that third millennium BC, a lot of Akkadian speakers start showing up, Akkadian names. And by 2334, the first Akkadian king ascends the throne in the city of Akkad. And the, the language of this Semitic speaking people, Akkadian, is where that the word Akkadian comes from. When you think of Akkadian, it's just the language of Babylonian and Assyrian. It's the people we later know as the Babylonians, of southern Mesopotamia and the Assyrians of northern Mesopotamia. But they eventually accrue political clout in Mesopotamia until they pretty much overthrow all the Sumerian cities. And Mesopotamia becomes an, an Akkadian speaking land. In fact, by 1800 BC, the Sumerians who invent civilization, who invent writing, th their language ceases to be spoken as a native tongue. It's only kept as a, a sacred language from which uh, to record, uh, you, you know, science and uh, special re religious texts. In, in essence, it's very similar to the way the uh, Catholic Church retained Latin as the sacred language of the mass for centuries, even into, you know, the 1950s. So you might say, like, all right, so give me some examples. So here, here, here's one. So. So they, they preserve the Sumerian language. So these Akkadian speakers, these Babylonians and the Assyrians, they preserve the Sumerian language through the use of what's called Sumerian logograms. And we, we just hardly, we don't have any examples of it. The, the only example that comes to mind is, you know, the symbol, the English symbol LB, which means pound. Well, it's, yes. it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the shortened form of Libra in Latin. It just means pound. That's the only example I can think of. So you're looking at the cuneiform sign called on. And in Sumerian, it just means sky, heaven. It's also read dingir, 
which means God. So around 2000 BC, you get this, these very large number of encyclopedias. They're Sumerian on one side, they're Akkadian on the other side. So they're using these Sumerian logograms as symbols and they just embed it in the writing. So instead of saying, I could say Shamu in my writing, or I could just say An, it means the same thing. However, what starts to happen is one Sumerian logogram can mean many, many words. So for instance, An, we just saw it meant skies and heavens, and it can be read Dingir, which means Ilu in Akkadian, God, okay? But it also means Yau, which means my or mine. It can mean Kakabu star. It can mean Shibultu, ear of barley. It can mean Sukupu, which means impale. It can mean Sha of, and we can Asaku, which means taboo or forbidden. So this one word can have all of these hidden meanings underneath it. And the astrologers are looking for that. When they find a pun, when they find what we would call a synonym, a homophone, or a homonym, they feel like they have just gotten a directly channeled divine piece of wisdom from the stars. So there's another phenomenon that yeah, I got to explain to you is it's the number of homophones. Homophones are just, if you remember your, your, your third grade uh, grammar classes back in grade school, homophones are words that sound the same but have different meanings. There are a jaw-dropping number of homophones in cuneiform. In fact, there's so many homophones in cuneiform. Okay, so punning with homophones, there are so many homophones in cuneiform writing that linguists had to invent a transliteration scheme that allowed, allowed you to figure out which cuneiform sign you're reading on a tablet. And you're like, so you'll see if you ever read transliterated cuneiform, they call it transliterated, you can call it transcribed cuneiform. It's a syllabic script. It's got 600 cuneiform signs. Every one of them has a name in the way that we call the letter A, A, but it says ah, and in the way the letter B says B, but it's got the name B, et cetera. Well, they've got 600 of them. It's syllabic. So when you're looking at these Sumerian logograms, you look at that top picture there is mul. That's the Sumerian word for star. But here's where it gets crazy. There's five other ways to write the word star in Sumerian. Like if you, if you were a little kid and you used to have those spelling tests, if you were allowed to write in cuneiform, you'd get 100% in every test because you could just write words in so many different ways. <laughs> so, so like there's mul too. That means star. Now, remember, the ancient scholar is only reading it mul. They know that's a different cuneiform sign that is read mul. That's why these astrologers, whose name is Tupsharu, writer, where they were the best of the best. They're the best linguists you can imagine. There's a mul three. That's the one that doesn't mean star. It means like wasp or it means like a, a water course, like a canal. Um, Mole four, that's used a lot for star. Mole five, rare but sometimes used cuneiform sign red mole, which means star in Sumerian. And then there's a mole X that's only used by the astrologers. And that means kakabu in Babylonian and Assyrian, which is, you know, star. Now, here's where it gets mind numbing. Every one of these cuneiform signs has a different reading and can represent different words. So the, if you look at the top of the page, mul can also be read mulu, which means mamulu in uh, Babylonian, arrow. The mul two sign can be read te, which is ushu, foundation, seam to ornaments, uh, sahalu, uh, which is pierce, and so on and so forth. So when you go through these cuneiform signs, when you write the word mul, you could have th the underlying meanings can relay Inscription, writing, shine brightly, star, foundation, ornament, pierce, watercourse, wasp, distant time, fruit, elated, field, cow, and month. So that's where cuneiform writing becomes jaw-dropping. You're like, oh my lord, what the heck? So you might say to yourself, like, so, all right, Mesopotamians are do it that, doing it that way. But did this idea of reading the starry sky as a text in which the action is defined by wordplay in the cuneiform titles of this, the constellations that make up a picture. It, did that 
did that spread, disseminate to other areas? Well, there's a phenomenon going on in in the Middle East, especially in the Near East. Um, so when a vanquishing king overthrows an enemy land, they round up all of the prognosticators of the future, including the astrologers. So because the astrologers were so prevalent and so important to the king, um, they tend to become the face of prognostication. So um, so there's this phenomenon which the ancient, a lot of scholars in the Near Eastern scholars refer to it as hostage astrologers. Well, did this happen in, in the ancient world? Well, Homer's name is hostage. Homer, the great, the, the father of, you know, uh, alphabetic uh, Greek poetry is named hostage. And there's a couple sources, ancient sources, like, first century BC and first or second century AD, where they they say, yes, he was a Babylonian that was taken hostage by the Greeks. And he shared this system of reading the stars with Greeks, with the Greeks. And then they used that to sculpt their own uh, Hellenic myths that we know of from, you know, from Homer and Hesiod. Another very well-known one from the Bible is Daniel. So, you know, Daniel is referred to, he, he's taken, he, three in, uh, Daniel and three of his countrymen are taken by Nebuchadnezzar II uh, during the Babylonian enslavement. And Daniel works his way up through the ranks and becomes the supervisor of all the Babylonian occult scholars, including the astrologers. So is this, wor- is this idea of reading the constellations as a pictographic script, has it spread? Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. So, let me just show you what's going on. So I hope I can. Ha- I, I hope that helped because now's the test, right? Yes, yes, <laughs> they yes. think there's going to be a test. Right? They're getting tested <laughs> today, right? So we all know Aries, the Golden Fleece Ram, right? The story of Aries, and and it's so quaint today. Like, oh, it's a ram, and it's got a golden fleece, and it can fly, and it carried around Phrixus and Helle, and Helle sadly fell off and and fell into the into the sea, and that's where we get the the name Hellespont. Um, well, th- that's literally embedded in the, the stars of Aries. And let me show you what I mean. Um, so New Year's Day, first millennium, beginning in the first millennium Mesopotamia, New Year's Day is marked by Aries. Now, in ancient Mesopotamia, Aries has a title. His name's Luhunga. It literally means man, hired worker. And the man is called a determinative. It's just a noun marker that says, this is a male profession, and you'd often not read it, but it goes with the word. Um, it doesn't have to be phoneticized. In fact, it's often not. It typically isn't phoneticized, and hunga just means hired worker. Now, this is the foundation of agricultural success and um, and you, you know economic success in the Middle East. You had to have this. The Pegasus Square is defined as a field. And right next to this hired worker constellation is Triangulum, the constellation Triangulum, and that was a plow. This defined how you, how the king became wealthy in ancient Mesopotamia. You fed your people because this is a divine job. You have to do it if the king's going to be successful. So, all right. Now, cuneiform writing, writing in clay tablets is cumbersome and tedious. So they're always trying to abbreviate. They're trying to shorten the writing, which is part of the reason why Sumerian logograms are easy, because then you can just use one cuneiform sign to imprint a word. Um, so one of the ways that you shorten, uh, if you look at Luhunga on that picture right there, that's Aries, the hired worker. Well, they would try to shorten his name to Lu, the first cuneiform sign. However, Lu is a determinative, and you're the grammatical rule in cuneiform is you're not supposed to pronounce that. So in the same way that we have grammatical rules, like like the first letter in a sentence is capitalized. Well, they had them too. One of them is <laughs> determinatives aren't vocalized. They're read, but they're not vocalized. So what happened is they inserted another cuneiform sign read Lu. And that cuneiform sign read Lu, which stood for hired worker, it's the first cuneiform sign. It meant man, but it they used another cuneiform sign. Well, it's also the cuneiform sign for ram. And since the 1940s, people have known that this is this pun 
created Aries the Ram. So I knew that back in grad school, but I was wondering, I was like, so what about this golden fleece? Are there more readings that no one's ever dipped into? And I'm like, when I started to look at it, I was like, oh no, it just can't be this simple. Yeah. So Lou can also be read C, which means become, right? So you have the words, the hired worker becomes the ram. So not only is there a pun, there's a verb inserted in it that tells you exactly what it did. This hired worker constellation became the ram. Now, there are many ways to write that cuneiform sign Lou in the same way we have like you can write the letter A in print, you can write it in cursive, you can write it in all different kinds of fonts. They had three or four different kinds of scripts in cuneiform. You could write a cursive form of it. You could write a very official form of it. Um, one of them is what's shown up at the top of the page. So if they were writing an abbreviated form of the hired worker constellation Aries, they could write it Lu. That word means ram. Word means become. If you look, it's comprised of two different cuneiform signs. One is a square. That square sign is called lagab. That means flying. That little, looks like a crossed cuneiform sign in the middle of that lu sign, that's the cuneiform sign bar. Bar means gold and fleece. So embedded in the cuneiform sign, all the words, when you lay them down, you get the hired worker becomes the flying gold fleece ram. And so there's your golden fleece. You know, that's where the, the idea comes from. Yeah. And then they abbreviated Lu many other ways, too. Remember, the original title was Lu Hunga. They abbreviated it as Mulu, which means constellation hired worker. They also abbreviated it Mulhun, which means constellation hired worker. They're just using one of the cuneiform signs. But when you when you know that's their abbreviations, they appear to be just writing down all the hidden words. So mul can also be read knob. Well, that's a homophone for the Sumerian word for sea. Hun means to fall into. Lu can be read udu, which is ram. Remember, I just mentioned that the lu sign was also the word for ram. Lu has the word lagab embedded in it, which means flying. It can be, it's got the bar sign embedded in it, which means golden fleece. Um, it can be read C, which means um, one of its reading not only does it mean become, but it also can be read. It, it represents the Babylonian word sohuru, which means curly. And curly is the Greek name Phrixus. That's what that boy's name is. That, that hero, Phrixus, his name means curly. And it's also, lu is the term for man. An alternate spelling for man is elu, and it just means carries. And if you translate elu into Greek, you get hele. Nobody's ever figured out what hele means. In, in essence, nobody knows what the hell the name hele means. Um, <laughs> and, and so, so it's right there. If you were translating it, you would just double the you would double the consonant, and you get il, ilu, and it, it can be read ile, and and you translate that into Greek and you get hele. So the flying gold fleece rams carries curly and hele. Curly, of course, frictious. And then you get also get the words Hele falls into the sea. So that's that's the gist of the book. That that's that's the nuts wow. And bolts of it. Okay, so <clears throat> just to make one quick comment before we continue, yeah. I want people yeah. to realize like if you know that there are mystery cults that don't want people to know these things, you have yeah. to imagine these constellations, zodiac symbols, and these ancient myths are probably built off of these things. So your average Joe isn't going to see these things. And you're probably like me. You never seen this. You're probably going, how do you know you're not just creating these ideas? See, he has obviously ac academic training on this, but as we get into this, we're going to see more examples as to how this gets elaborated and shown throughout mythologies over time that I think are really interesting. I mean, this really, yeah. this opens up like, the way I get excited on discovering something is mythology and not literal history, I'm sure they got excited by finding out these words played a significance as a story into this celestial single image that he's talking about of the past history of the earth as on or as in heaven, 
so on earth or as above, so below. Yeah. That whole idea is playing in their thinking. And this is really cool because we're getting into trying to get into the mind of someone like this. So as we carry on, I just wanted to make mention, keep an open mind, keep an open mind because you're going to see maybe how this plays out even better. Yeah. And, and so, and remember, if you find a pun and you're an ancient astrologer, you believed it was the secret of the gods. You had just been, I, I, the gods, the star gods have just divulged a secret to you in the same way that Jesus said, Peter, you are rock. And on this rock, I'm going to build my church. It's the same exact thing. Um, this so, really begs another question of language. And that's yeah. something that we can't get into. But language itself is a very interesting thing. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, uh, some some doyens of Near Eastern scholarship, the, of cuneiform scholarship, one, one that comes to mind is Scott Noble. Um, he, he often says that, you know, the word in the ancient world was the um, – is a, it was a crystallized form. Like if you said the word dog, like kalbu in, in Babylonian means dog, right? So if you said that word, it, the word itself was the crystallized essence of a dog. Um, and we just don't have that concept today. Like we think of the yeah. cells of the dog, the, the physical, the lungs of the dog, the heart of the dog is what makes up a dog. They wouldn't have thought of it that way. They thought the word dog was the essence of dog. Hmm. And um, so so it, it, if I can just go on, we, we looked at the golden fleeced flying flying ram embedded in Aries, and that's probably how Aries came to be known as that um, in, in Greek mythology. Um, I want to look at the celestial garden of Eden. So I, I got to tell you, again, we go back to that hired worker constellation. If you remember, the first day of the vernal equinox, Helical rising, so the dawn rising, the hired worker rises, east is on the left side of your screen. That's what they're looking for. This tableau lays out right in front of them. Got the hired worker constellation. You got his plow. You got the field he's uh, he's uh, predestined to till right there. It's called the Pegasus Square. It's a distinct square in Pegasus. Next to it is Ea. The, uh, the water god constellation from Mesopotamia, Enki and Sumerian. This is the god that caused the flood. This is the god. Now, this is where it gets... Uh, we, again, when I found this, I'm like, remember, I, I, I can do a bunch of ancient linguists. I'm no great linguist. I'm just your average bear. You know what I mean? But, but, but I can do it. Um, and, and I'm looking at this, I'm like, you're kidding me, right? Like, you're kidding me. So I just showed you that the abbreviated form of Aries was Lu. Remember, it meant man hired worker, but they would cut it off because it was hard to write in cuneiform. Well, Lu means man. Well, that's what Adam means. So there's a guy named Adam standing right there, okay? The, and I'm looking at the cuneiform sign used to write the uh, Pegasus Square constellation, the constellation of the field that he's destined to till, right? Well, God, its sign name is God. Well, that's the Hebrew word for garden. And I'm like, okay, th that was hard. Um, so then I'm looking at Ea. One of Ea's epithets is Edin. Just means spring. Springs, like water source, you know, because he's the water god. And that's got about 10 different readings. One of them is May. Well, May is the future tense form of the verb of being in Sumerian. It means he will be. And I'm like, but <laughs> that's Yahweh. That's what Yahweh means. He will be. So I'm like, all right, I'm going to go out on a limb here. I think this might be connected to the Garden of Eden story, you know? So I don't mean to sound cocky or flippant. I, 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 I'm just telling you what it says, you know? Um, so I'm looking at other ways to read this cuneiform sign gone. Remember the Pegasus Square, that square constellation that in Mesopotamia was a field, literally means garden in Hebrew. And ancient Babylonians believed that if a constellation resembled a cuneiform sign, that cuneiform sign was its astroglyph, uh, very much the way you think of Egyptian hieroglyphics. So there's one very distinctly square cuneiform sign. It's called Lagab. And that really became the astroglyph for this constellation. You could write it gone. You could refer to it as Lagab. But Lagab has about 23 different readings. One of them is Ni, which means in. One of them is Nigin, which means east. And 
it's also the Sumerian logogram that means the word Bamatu. Now, Bamatu is kind of interesting to me because it, it's a synonym for Eden. So when you say the garden in Eden, Eden is a Sumerian logogram. There's no, there's no word in, like, there's no word in Hebrew called Eden. It comes out of the Sumerian, and it means stepland, or you could probably translate it as backcountry. So, so, so Lagab means Eden. It means stepland. So these cuneiform signs reveal or divulge that there is a garden in Eden in the east, and that shows up almost exactly, I think it's Genesis 2, line 8, gets translated directly into the Hebrew, the biblical Hebrew. So again, you look at that, remember that Mesopotamian hired worker constellation who was to till the field standing next to the water god Ea? Well, the alternate readings for their, those cuneiform signs revealed to astrologer authors, such as maybe in the tradition of, of Daniel, that that Ares was a guy named Man, or Adam in Hebrew, that there was a garden in Stepplan, in Eden, and it was the Pegasus Square, and that there was this, this deity that caused the flood, and his name was He Will Be, which is Yahweh. So a garden in Eden in the east becomes this still frame of a scene from, you know, uh, the Garden of Eden story. And so you might say, well, how did, you know, Yahweh end up in the garden? Well, astronomical texts, can you form astronomical texts, refer to the Pegasus Square, that garden constellation or field constellation in, in cuneiform. They call it the Shubat, which literally means the dwelling of or the residence of Aquarius. So, so this garden Eden is where Yahweh Aquarius is dwelling. Okay, so... Um, so that's how they got that idea. But but there's way more to it. So like, remember in the in Genesis, it says that Yahweh planted a garden in Eden. Well, he planted a garden in Eden because it's right there. The the Apine constellation, that plow constellation, that also represents the verb uh, ratio in, in, in Babylonian. It means to plant. And this square uh, field, uh, the garden constellation, it's also a cuneiform sign that means box for obvious reason. It looks like a box. And an alternate reading for box is aka, which means to plant. So the idea that Yahweh, embodied in Aquarius, planted a garden in Eden in the east is right there in the stars. You're never going to find Eden, probably because it's not anywhere on earth. It's actually in the stars. And like the Our Father prayer, on earth as it is in heaven, they were bringing the heavens down to earth. So, and you can, you can keep going. So how did Adam get into the garden? Well, you know, ya, you just look at all the cuneiform signs for Lu Hunga. Remember, that's the hired worker constellation in cuneiform. So Daniel and all of his countrymen who were various scholars who were studying with him in colloquies with Babylonian astrologers learn that Lu Hunga can, can mean man. It can mean the word uh, Manu in Babylonian, which means whom. It can mean, Hun can mean Banu, which means to make. It can mean uh, Ina in Babylonian, which means in. The Ga sign can mean Shikanu, which means to put. So you lay it all down, translate it into Hebrew, and you get Yahweh put there, the man whom he had made. Um, and you can keep going on that. Like, I, I don't want to just stick with one myth. You can show that Adam made the woman from the rib of the man, and he made it turn into the woman. Um, that's all embedded as as homonyms, homophones, and synonyms in the cuneiform signs for Aries. Um, you can you, the location of the fruit. The the, the um, that cuneiform sign. The astroglyph for the Pegasus Square constellation, that Lagab sign right in the middle of your screen, there's a cuneiform sign. Well, that also means Inbu, which is fruit. So they can they can use the cuneiform sign Lagab to describe the Pegasus Square. They can use the cuneiform sign Gan to describe the Pegasus Square. But Gan can also be read Ashag, which means forbidden. Gan is a garden. Uh, Gan is a synonym for Asha, which also means field, and Asha can render inalibi, which means in the middle. Um, the, again, the linguistics are, are very complicated, and I tuck them away in footnotes, but I'm just showing you they're right there. Like, 
an ancient scholar could read this like, oh, it could mean this, oh, it could mean this, oh, it could mean this, oh, it could mean this. Fruit in the middle of the garden is forbidden, you know. Um, there's trees up there. The words tree of life are embedded in the cuneiform signs for the Pegasus Square. The words uh, uh, fruit from the tree of uh, good knowledge of good and evil, that's all up there. And I go through that in the book. Um, there's carabine, and that this is the most intriguing aspect. So, so remember, you know, Yahweh puts uh, carabim to protect the uh, the the root to the to the Garden of Eden, so that they don't eat the fruit of the, from the tree of life and have eternal life. They don't become like gods, right? Adam and Eve don't become like gods. So he sticks a cherubim there. I guess in English it's translated cherubim. He also puts a flaming turning sword. Like if you were excavating and you found it flaming turning sword, that would catch your eye, right? Well, they're, you're not going to find that in an excavation. Like the, but it's in the stars, and it's embedded as wordplay. The cuneiform sign Lagab, if you look at the bottom part of your screen, that's an astroglyph for that garden constellation, that square garden constellation. It can be read gear, which means sword. It means flaming. It means turning. It can mean Nagin, which means east. Um, the carabim are actually coming right out of um, one of the readings for uh, Aries. So in the in the, the lexical commentaries, they, they write Aries, they write Gi-Rubu. And it's just Gi is a Sumerian logogram that's read Rubu. Well, that literally, if you translate that into Hebrew, it gets Caribbean. That's what it, Caribbean is. The, 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 the U with the little hat on it, if you look right in the middle of your screen where it says Gi-Rubu, that's the plural ending. And in Hebrew, that's the im. The, the I am ending in him in, in, in the Hebrew is just the plural ending. So, so the cherubim's there, the flaming turning sword's there, Yahweh's there, Adam's there, Eve is there, although I didn't go into that in this presentation because I didn't want to just stick with one mixed myth. I just, I just, I just wanted to, to kind of roll through a few of the myths now, maybe at a more faster pace now that you've kind of been um, introduced to how the word plays are occurring. So... So there's a wet region of the night sky. When you look up the night sky, there's eight contiguous watery constellations. You know, we know them as the dolphin, the goat fish, the southern fish, the water god Aquarius, uh, the sea serpent constellation, Cetus, uh, I guess in Cetus in English, um, the twin fishes, the river constellation, and the Argo, which is, you know, the boat. So in Mesopotamia, they had similar constellations, right? They, they pretty much originate in Mesopotamia. But there's an, an intriguing word embedded in at the surface of those celestial waters. It's if you look at uh, at the middle of your screen, you'll see Taurus and there's a, a crown on the face of Taurus. Well, the Hyades asterism in Taurus is defined as an agu. An agu is just a word for crown. That's cool. That's great. It's a crown constellation of the sky god Anu. Cool. However, it's also the exact word for devastating flood. And the flood story comes out of the blue in Mesopotamia. The Sumerians are writing from 3000 BC. They don't ever mention a flood story. Then in about 2050 BC, Sumerian king list, all of a sudden you get this ref reference to this flood that... Um, that, that separates time into two epochs, you know, before the flood and after the flood. Um, what's interesting is the original flood boat in cuneiform is this boat, called, it's the Magor boat. So you might say, well, that, that's cool, a Magor boat, it's a cargo boat. It's a barge or a cargo boat. So there's the cuneiform signs for this Magor boat. This Magor boat. Now this, is, this was the basis for my master's thesis. So, so I'm looking at it and I'm like, no, you're, you're kidding me. So I'm looking at those cuneiform signs. Ma is, it's the Ma Tu sign. And so if you see cuneiform scholars start talking, like they'll say like Ma Tu Gore 8. Um, it looks like you're flashing gang signs, but you're not. You're just, <laughs> you're, identifying the, you're just identifying the number the cuneiform signs connected to. Um, so yeah, so it's the Ma Tu Gore 8 sign. But I didn't want to put those little subscripts in there and confuse everybody. Ma just means go, boat in Sumerian. So Gore has many meanings. One of them is flood, like devastating flood. It's the flood 
the great flood, the one that was eventually associated with Noah. So I'm looking at this. Here's where it gets crazy. It's also a constellation mentioned in cuneiform star atlases, and it's in the southern region of the night sky. So you start putting it together. Cuneiform literature describes this Magor boat. It's the original flood boat. It's a constellation in the southern region of the night sky. It's a deified constellation, by the way. It's a god. And in the, uh, in the uh, Sumerian uh, myth, Gilgamesh and Aga, a Magor boat gets its bow chopped off. So it doesn't have a bow. So I'm looking for a crescent-shaped boat floating around the southern region of the night sky that's missing its bow, and it's a deity. Well, when you look at the Argo, the Argo is a giant boat it's floating around the southern region of the night sky. It's a deified boat, and it has its prow chopped off, just like the Mesopotamian Magor boat. So it's very likely that the Mesopotamian Magor boat, this original flood boat, became the Argo. And by the way, the word for stern in cuneiform is arku. It means the, the rear end of an object. And if you translate arku into Greek, you get Argu, which is Argo. It's Argo. We pronounce it in English, Argo. It's it's an omega at the end, so it's an U. It's, it's Argu. So it's very likely that this Mesopotamian Magor boat, this original flood boat, becomes the Argo. And so then you look at it, and then these floodwaters have all new meaning. So the celestial wet region of the night sky is now being defined as a devastating flood, and there's a flood boat on it, literally a flood boat, named the Magor boat which means flood boat in, in Sumerian. So later, though, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, they describe the flood boat as, they say the flood, the prototype for the ark is an iku. They call it an iku. Remember that field we were just talking about? Remember that the field that the oh, hired yeah. worker was designed to till? Well, that's the prototype for the ark doesn't make any sense. There's no such thing as a field boat in ancient Mesopotamia. They, they've got, you know, water transportation lists, never listed. So out of the blue, Tablet 11, Epic of Gilgamesh, the flood boat's called a Niku, which is a field. Doesn't make any sense. until so you start looking up at the night sky and you say, wait a minute, where's that Pegasus square, right? Where is that? It's, you could, it's the sign name is gone. Like, that's the name of this cuneiform sign. And it's red iku, which just means field. It's also the Babylonian Ark in the Epic of Gilgamesh. So where is it? It's floating right up there at the, in the center of your screen as the Pegasus Square. It's floating on the celestial floodwaters. Some variation of astrologer perceived this as the original Ark. So, um, so... That unveils another, by the way, every story element from Noah's flood is up here. Like there's a, you, you know, there's a raven constellation, like the, the, the bird release themes up here. The, Gemini is a twin mountains constellation. Um, there's a rainbow constellation. It's it literally, it's a archer's bow constellation. That's what Yahweh puts in the sky. Every, and I go into that into the book, and I don't go into it here in the slideshow because I'm trying to scoot through this so that we get a kind of, a, it's more of a sampler for the, for the viewers. So one of the real mystical terms in the Bible is the term for Noah's Ark. It's Tebot. In archaic biblical Hebrew, it would be Tebot. And it's there at the bottom in italics, and it's, it literally encodes astronomical information. So if you were a Babylonian astrologer in the tradition of Daniel and you were translating the celestial writing of the night sky into Hebrew, you'd say, all right, there's a field constellation called Iku. And it's a constellation, so we're going to call it Mul Iku, the, the star field or the constellation field, right? Well, that Mul sign, you know, Mul Tu, can be read Te. And in an abbreviated form of the word iku. Remember, iku also means box. An abbreviated form of box is p, and an alternate reading is ba. So when the biblical authors referred to the ark as a tebot, they were embedding astronomical, ancient astronomical information. Tebot 
literally means you know, it can be read constellation field or constellation box, the box constellation, which is what the arc is, which is why nobody can figure out uh, the the etymological origin for arc. Teba. So that's a little take on it. So this uh, exposes another really interesting thing. And I don't mean to get pedantic here, but one of my fa most fascinating aspects of the flood story is its description in the Quran. So I, I just wrote it there. So he built an ark. They're talking about Noah now, Nuh in Arabic. Um, and when our will was done, the water welled out from the oven, we said to Noah, take into the ark a pair from each species, your tribe, and all the true believers. Two passages from the, the, the Quran affirm that the flood waters and the great flood came out of an oven. Now, I've excavated ovens in the Near East in, in Syria and Jordan. They're about this, they're round and they're about the size of your kitchen table. And they're called tenord in Arabic. Um, and that's what the flood waters come out of in Arabic. Well, that doesn't even make any sense. It's absolutely bizarre and illogical until you remember that that arc constellation has alternate readings. Iku means field, Iku means box. That arc constellation also means to carry flood waters. It's a verb meaning to carry flood waters. And a synonym for it is sheed, which can, which is an, a, a reading of it. One variation of it is gear, which means oven. So the ovens carry the flood waters. Remember, Muhammad's illiterate. He learned the ancient myths from his tutor, which is a guy named Salman al-Farsi, who was a Magi. He was basically a Persian Magus. Tutors, um, Muhammad probably revealed this information to Muhammad, and Muhammad embeds it into the Quran, in the Quranic version of the flood story, which is really, um, if you notice, if you've ever read the Quran, it's really disjointed. It's a really disjointed book, probably because he's, it's a recital. He's literally reciting astronomical myths and, and ancient myths that are being taught to him by Salman al-Farsi. In fact, his wives are complaining. They're like, dude, you're not spending any time with us. You're always with that, that magician over there, Salman, you know, and, and in about 10 passages in the Quran, um, they complain over and over that, it, you know, the people that didn't buy into the Quran that stayed pagan when uh, Muhammad originally converted to Islam or created Islam, um, they, they accused him of recycling pagan ancient myths. They call the myths of the ancients into the Quran. And this is probably one of them. So, Another interesting little story, my, one of my favorites, because when I was in Catholic grade school, like everybody was fighting to do a story on, you know, Samson, because you could say he used the, uh, the, the, the jawbone of an ass. So when you're in fifth grade, you get to say ass <laughs> and you won't get in trouble. And the nuns won't slap you. Right. So so this is one of my favorite stories. So you're like, all right, I'm having a hard time with this one, even in fifth grade. You know, at about the time I stopped believing in Santa Claus, I'm figuring how are you going to kill a thousand Philistine warriors with the jawbone of a donkey? At some point, that thing is going to break, right? So you're looking at the name Shimshun, Hebrew's name. I just wrote it in Hebrew there. It goes right to left. It's all consonantal. The WN at the end, that's a diminutive. That's like you, you have the word kitchen and then we have the word kitchenette. That WN is like the et in kitchenette. It means little or small. So it means the shim the shimish part just means son. So Samson or Shimshun in Hebrew, his name literally means little son. So this guy, little son, kills a thousand men with the jawbone of an ass. Okay. So is there this little son? Remember that a goo constellation, that crown constellation, the Hyades, that's embedded in Taurus. Well, one of its Sumerian logograms is main, literally means crown or tiara in, in Sumerian. It's written agu. Remember, agu means the devastating flood. It also means crown. However, main can also represent the sun god, Shemesh. So it means sun, but it also represents the word sharu. Sharu means king and it means infant or child. 
So it's so you literally have the word infant son or little son embedded in the title of this Hyades asterism. And Samson's name means little son. So all of a sudden, you got this guy named little son. Now, remember, the Hyades is embedded in Taurus. In, in Sumerian, Taurus is just, it's the goo for sign. It's red goo for. So Gu just means bull, but Gu, because bulls are so big and strong, it's also a, a term for warrior. And Gu three can mean to name. So, and it also means to name and a name. So you have uh, a, a warrior named infant son or little son or baby son. And so that's what I think Samson is. That's where the idea comes from. Now, here's where it gets absolutely bizarre. So one of the cuneiform terms for Taurus is the gear three sign. But gear three can also mean donkey. Now, that Hyades asterism, it's a crown asterism, but it's also an Isu asterism. It means jawbone. So it's the jawbone of the bull. But the cuneiform signs for Taurus can also be read jawbone of the donkey. So you have this... I use the word polysemus, this, these hidden words, these second, secondary meanings to the original term that the ancient astrologers are viewing as revelations. So they're like, wait, a guy named Little Son, you know, uh, he, there's a jawbone right there, right next to him. There's a jawbone of a donkey right next to him. So how do we know he grabbed it? Well, one of the cuneiform terms for bull is lu in, in Babylonian. And lu is a, it's a, it's a homophone for the Sumerian lu, which means, it means man, it means, you know, it means ram. It also means to grab. So Samson, little son, grabs the jawbone of the donkey. And then, you know, the Hyades, little son is Samson. Um, the eye star in Aldebaran is the brightest star in Aldebaran. It's the alpha star. Um, so star in Sumerians, Egi. And remember, they attach a whole bunch of different meanings to these Sumerian logograms. Egi, um, it can also mean a thousand. So it means I, it means spring, it means a thousand. Um, it also can be read Gi, which renders the verb to kill. And Taurus, the the Babylonian term for it is Lu. It's that L-U and with a little hat on the U. Um, it's an extra long. It's called an ultra heavy U. And it just means Lu, man. So Samson kills a thousand men. And by the way, in Hebrew Bible, it says man. It doesn't say men. It's singular. So and every other aspect of the story, their bodies fall in two heaps. The word two heaps is in there. Um, so um, anyway, I just wanted to say that I'm just trying to give you a sampler. So there's another example where you have a, a bizarre supernatural aspect of a myth. I'm not saying Samson wasn't a real man, but by the time that story about Samson got written down in biblical Hebrew, all they had was, yeah, we have a guy named Little Son and he's a great warrior. So they were trying to figure out like, what were some of his feats? They would turn to the stars, you know, um, so, uh, again, so uh, Jonah, another one of those really bizarre myths, he's swallowed by a sea serpent, excuse me, swallowed by a big fish in the Hebrew version of the story. And he's swallowed by a sea serpent constellation in the Greek version of this, of the Jonah story. So let me just, you know, go into a little more detail there. The Hebrew Bible says that Jonah was swallowed by a dog lol. A dog lol just means it means a gigantic fish. However, when you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek version of the Old Testament, and when you look at the New Testament, and Jesus makes this uh, designation, he says that, that Jonah is swallowed by a ketos, and that's a sea dragon. And um, it's a specific kind of sea dragon. In fact, it's depicted in early Christian iconography. So whenever you see Jonah being swallowed, he's being swallowed by a dog-headed sea serpent. I assure you, there's no fisherman that ever caught that species of animal. <laughs>
It's never been caught, but yet it's shown swallowing Jonah. So where do you find this Ketos finding the constellations? It's the dog-headed sea serpent, sea serpent constellation. It's also referred to as a sea dragon. What, what you need to understand, it's, it's, it's got a dog's head or a wolf's head. There is nothing like this in, a, in, in the sea. The story is coming out of the stars. So you might say, okay, well, then how does that reconcile this story? How did, uh, think about Jesus. You know, Jesus says that, that Jonah is going to be the sign. If you remember, the Pharisees are questioning him, and Jesus says, there's only going to be one sign. You want to see signs? I'm not going to do any more signs. There's going to be one sign. The sign's Jonah. So how did he come up with that idea? Well, again, remember that Magor boat that is embedded in Argo? Remember the original cuneiform signs? And there's like, again, there's like eight different ways to write the, the, the word ma in cuneiform. There's about, I think there's 23 different cuneiform signs that are red gore. So ma gore, which means flood boat, ma can also mean, it means boat, but it can also be read, uh, it's uh, nibu in uh, Babylonian, which is prophet or spokesman, which is prophet. And gore is just the standard cuneiform sign for dove. So gore is a standard cuneiform sign for flood. It's also the standard cuneiform sign for, for dove. And that's what Jonah means. Jonah's name means dove. So you have the prophet dove or the prophet Jonah embedded in the cuneiform spelling for the Argo, the original Ark. So again, how did Jesus know this? Like, how did Jesus come around and say, like, wait a minute, I know that there is this guy named Jonah and that he swallowed by a big fish in Hebrew. Remember, Jesus knew Hebrew and Jesus knew Greek. So he swallowed by a big fish in Hebrew and he swallowed by a, uh, a ketos, a, a sea dragon in, in, uh, in Greek. Well, you find it in the cuneiform uh, story of Enuma Elish. That's the Babylonian version of Genesis. In fact, there's so many correlates to Genesis that many Old Testament scholars call it the Babylonian Genesis because there's just so many correlations. But one of the terms um, for th there are three sea dragons made. The, the Tiamat is uh, the goddess, the sea goddess. And she's married to Abzu. Abzu becomes part of the, the wet region of the night sky. And Tiamat becomes part of these celestial waters too. She's put up there. She's killed and she's put up there. But her body turns into three different sea dragons. One of them's Hydra. And then there's two others. In the collective, they're referred to as, if you look at the bottom of your screen, they're called Mushmak. Literally, the word Mush in Kinyar form just means it means snake or dragon. Mach just means gigantic. It means big, giant, huge, whatever. So, so moosh can mean dragon. However, these lexical commentaries studied by Babylonian astrologers, these Sumerian logogram lists, also refer to it as a kind of fish. It's probably a kind of eel. So, so moosh mach can literally simultaneously mean gigantic fish, but it can also mean gigantic dragon. And that's why the sea dragon becomes known. Probably J Jesus understood that this sea dragon was a big, simultaneously a big fish and simultaneously a sea dragon. By the way, in, in Taurus, um, the goo, the term for Taurus is goo. Goo just means to swallow. Goo can also be read gar, which means to, to provide. And, and, you know, in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible, it says Yahweh provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah. Those words are right there in that stellar to blow. And I was just pointing them out. They're, in, they're embedded mostly in Taurus um, and, and the uh, Aldebaran, the brightest star in Taurus. So Jesus calls Jonah the sign. Well, how did he come up with that idea? Jonah is, remember, the prophet Jonah is embedded in that, the Argo constellation, the boat constellation. There's a river there. The cuneiform signs for river is Eid. The sign name is Etu, which means sign. So in that stellar tableau, you have 
Jonah is the sign, which is probably why Jesus said that in Matthew's gospel. He said, I'm not going to give you any sign. You're only going to get one sign, and that sign is Jonah. So how did Jesus know this? It, it suggests that Jesus was some kind of Babylonian magician who was deeply in, uh, knowledgeable of Mesopotamian astrology. So you might say, well, geez, is that possible? Well, remember, people who didn't convert to, to Christianity, if you were a Jew or you were a pagan and you didn't convert to Christianity, you believed that Jesus performed all of his miracles using magic. So Jews and pagans view Jesus as a mag magician. There's a picture of him there raising Lazarus from the dead uh, using a, a, a magic wand. So um, I just wanted to, again, I'm just giving the, every word from the Jonah and the sea monster story is embedded in the stars. I go into it in depth in the book, but I'm just trying to give you a sampler here. Like, the, you know, there's a little box of chocolates, you know, Valentine's Day is coming up. <laughs> a little sampler, the Whitman sampler. And I'm trying to just give you that. So uh, I the, I think in the book I called it the chapter 12 is the stellar tableau of Jesus' nativity. So one of the most amazing things about the, the birth story of Jesus is there's two different stories. Like Matthew says that astrologers from the east followed this star to D Jerusalem. So that would have taken two to three months. Then they get to Jerusalem. They meet up with Herod. Then the star hangs a left and goes five and a half miles south and stops over the house where the child is. And Jesus is born in a house in Bethlehem. Stars just can't do that. It's not possible. And Luke has a totally different story. It's totally irreconcilable. Luke says that, wait, they were, they were registering for a census and that, that Mary was, was expecting and that she gave birth to the child. There was no room at the, uh, the local caravanserai, um, which is, you know, we call it a hostel, but it's a caravanserai. It's where your caravans stop. And, you know, so they had to sleep out in the courtyard where all the animals are kept. And they had to use a manger as a makeshift crib, you know, a fatinee, which is a manger, it's a feeding trough, right? So they're totally, in, in fact, Luke goes, that's the sign. And the word he uses, Sameon, which means constellation sign. And you're like, what? And it starts to make sense when you realize that, wait, there's a manger constellation. There's a child constellation. There's a pregnant virgin constellation. And by the way, her name's Bitter Sea, which is what Mary means. In, in Hebrew, Mariam means, Mariam means Bitter Sea. So you look at Regulus, cuneiform astronomical text. They, they're unequivocal. They call, them, they call this star the Sharu star. It literally means king, but it simul is simultaneously the word for child or infant, baby. Um, the same way we have bear in the woods to bear a child. One of the logograms, Sumerian logograms for, the, for this, this star is May, and May means anointed one in cuneiform. That's Christ. So you have a Christ child and king star, which is exactly how Jesus is described in Matthew and Luke's Gospels. So you might say, well, all right, there's this you look in there, if you look at the lion there, you'll see Sharu. There's your child star. That's a Christ child star. And wait a minute, what's next to it? Well, in Mesopotamia, you know, Virgo is, she's not a Parthenus, which is virgin in Greek. She's a pharaoh. But, uh, but in the Greek star atlases, she is a virgin. She's a Parthenus. But Cuneiform star atlases refer to her northeastern stars as the goddess Eru. And Eru is a pregnancy goddess. She's lit literally the goddess of pregnancy. So all of a sudden you have Virgo becomes this pregnant virgin constellation next to a Christ child star in Regulus. And Abscene is, um, if you look at the central part of your screen there, is the, it's it's the word furrow, agricultural furrow in Mesopotamia. However, um, ab, the cuneiform sign ab is another word for virgin, and it also means maratu, and maratu means bitter, and it means sea, and bitter sea is what mar yam, 
Mariam in Greek is from the Hebrew Mariam. It just means bitter sea. It means it's salty sea. You can't drink it. It's salty sea. That's what they're referring to. Right. Isn't isn't that word Maratu also used? And I think I'm I'm being funny here, but there's a movie called Army of Darkness. And he had to remember three words when he went to the co- the Book of the Dead. And one of them, I think, was Maratu. But he's like, uh, Klatu, Maratu. <laughs> and then he like gets the last one wrong. And he's like, <laughs> and then like the Army of the Dead comes back. But it's it's actually interesting. I, it sounds like one of the words he's reciting. I don't know why I had to yeah. bring that up. Well, yeah, no, probably, it, it, again, you know, I, I'm not doing anything new here. Every scholar, every Cuneiform scholar knows this, but they've never said, hey, is there a picture of this in the stars? That's where my research becomes seminal. So you might say, well, okay, pregnant virgin named Bitter Sea. Okay. Now, remember, that star, it, it, there is no star in Luke. There is no, you know, prodigious star. This star goes for three months from the east, stops over Jerusalem, hangs a left and goes five and a half miles to Bethlehem and then stops over Jesus's house. That's not possible. That's absolutely mythological. There's no star that can do that. However, the, the words in the, you know, in the, uh, the New Testament in Matthew's gospel read, the star led them until having come and stood over the house where the child was. All of those verbs, all of those nouns and verbs and, you know, and pronouns, every single one of them can be traced to wordplay embedded in Regulus and in, um, uh, you know, um, uh, the star that it, that house is Regulus, which is Leo, the, the lion constellation. So, and I just go through that in the book. Um, and I, I, you know, again, I don't want to get pedantic and just go down and go through every single cuneiform sign, but that's tucked away in the footnotes. But what you end up getting is the cuneiform words, the star led them until having come, it stood over the house where the child was. And you're like, oh, that's exactly what Matthew wrote. So, Luke says, remember, Luke has a totally different story. So this tableau starts to make sense when you realize that the the star cluster M44 in Cancer, which is just west of the lion, is a manger asterism. It's right in the star atlas of of ancient Greece, way before the birth story of Jesus. So remember, all of these titles exist before the birth story of Jesus is written. The author of Matthew, the author of Luke, they have no clue how Jesus was born. Everybody who was alive when Jesus was born, the only two people that were there were, were you know, Joseph and Mary, and they're long dead. So they're trying to re, to, to re uh, invent this story or redefine this story. They're going to look in the stars. They know there's a, a Christ child constellation in, in Regulus. They know there's a pregnant virgin named Mary in Virgo. They know there's a manger asterism right next to the the uh, the Christ child star, in which is Regulus. And then they're just saying, "Well, here's what the word plays say." There's there's a there's there's a the word an infant. There's the word wrapped in cloth. There's the word lying. There's the word in, and the, there's the word manger. Oh, that's going to become the constellation sign. He uses Luke uses the term the term Semeon. Semeon literally can be translated constellation functioning as a sign. So so all of a sudden, um, you know, Regulus is the Semeon. It's the constellation sign. And I think it's based on this stellar tableau. Um, and, you know, so uh, anyway, that's that myth. And then uh, I, I was just going to step into the Jesus walking on water myth. So most people don't realize that you know, Jesus walks on water. It's mentioned in Matthew, Mark, and John. Luke doesn't write it down. Um, and again, the stories are irreconcilable. What happens in Matthew and what happens in Mark and what happens in John are absolutely irreconcilable. Like Matthew says, Peter walks on water for a short time and then sinks below the sea. Mark says, Jesus walks past the boat. He literally walked past. He meant to go by them. It says in uh, Mark, I think it's six verse 48. And and John says, well, they're out in the middle of the lake. Well, the Sea of Galilee is seven miles wide, seven or eight miles wide. They're in the middle of the lake. So they're three or four miles out. 
And then the boat tri- teleports to the other side of the lake once Jesus comes inside the boat. And you're like, that's a three-mile teleportation. And no one writes that down. Nobody could remember that. Doesn't even make sense. However, when you turn to the stars, you realize that, wait a minute, uh, Hesiod in his astronomy, his t- the title of the book is called The Astronomy, um, he reports that uh, Orion could walk on water 700 years before Jesus performs the miracle. And well, how did he know that? Well, there's a picture. Whenever you see Orion in the night sky, Orion's literally walking on the celestial waters. His front foot is in the, the is the first star in the river constellation, Eridanus. So then you look at his cuneiform titles. And you're like, okay, Dean Gir Damu, literally the deity sun as in S-O-N. Like Damu just means sun. And I just put the cuneiform signs up there. And another one of his titles is messenger. It's Muls Sukal. Commonly, it's translated as, as messenger. Um, you could translate it as vizier or secretary, but it's more commonly translated as messenger. So you write down all the possible meanings for those cuneiform signs. Damu means sun. Dingir means God. Dingir can also represent the Babylonian word sha, which is of. Da can mean of. Mu can mean of. Sukal is literally the term the bat for the, the, the Sumerian logogram for Pashishu, which means anointed one in Babylonian. It's Christ, anointed one. Mul can also be read Shuhub, which means to tread upon. Mul can also be read Nab, which is sea. So all of a sudden you have the words, the son of God, the anointed one, the Christ, treads upon the sea. And that's probably how Matthew, Mark, and uh, John realized that Jesus performed this miracle. He walked upon the celestial waters. So all of a sudden, Orion is now walking. You know, Jesus is walking on water in, in the guise of Orion, Derek. So he's the son of God. He's the Christ. He's walking on the celestial waters. Okay. Um, and I go into all of the discrepancies in the stories, the ones that don't make sense. You know, there's a there's a, a rock constellation walking on water with Jesus in this picture story. Uh, there's the words meant to walk by, which is probably how why Mark wrote down that absurd passage in 648 of his gospel. And also um, uh, instantly reached the other side of the lake is also embedded in this uh, stellar picture story. So I don't want to, you know, go too far into that. And so I, my, my theory is that this stellar, this seawalk uh, tableau is what served as the basis for Jesus' miracle. And then I just wanted to, to conclude, I just wanted to touch on the Quran. So um, one of the things Muhammad mentions in at least two different passages in the Quran, the Quran is considered to be a celestial tablet preserved or kept in, in heaven, up in the sky. Sama the Arabic word for heaven and some of the Arabic is this, it's the word for heaven or sky. What are the big differences in the ancient world? Like we have the word heaven, which is where gods live. You know what I mean? There's angels playing harps and all that kind of stuff. And the sky is where we do hard astronomy. That's where we look up in the sky and find the stars. In the ancient world, the word for sky and the word for heaven is the same word. An in Cuneiform, Sumerian, Shamu in Babylonian, Sama in Arabic, uh, Shemaim in Hebrew, they both mean heaven and they both mean sky. So the Quran is kept in the sky, according to Muhammad and the Quran, right? So you see, remember, Muhammad was tutored by this multilingual, remarkable scholar named Salman al Farsi, Salman the Persian. And you see vestiges of this astro- astrological wisdom in the Quran itself. So Surah or chapter 53 is called al Nejum, the star. Chapter 54, Surah 54 is al Kamar, the moon. Uh, chapter 85 is al Baruj, which means, it means the zodiac. And uh, chapter 95 is al Shams, the sun. I mean, could you imagine instead of reading like, you know, the gospel of Mark, if it was gospel of the moon, gospel of the zodiac, gospel of the sun. I mean, we'd be like, whoa, 
there must be some celestial meaning in these in these words. Um, so I, I just find the, the Quran utterly fascinating. It's embedded with so much celestial wisdom. I look forward to delving deeper into it. So one of the things here, this is the Nabataean guy. This is, I did two field seasons in Petra, Jordan. Um, so one of the things in pre-Islamic Islam, uh, so pagan Islam, you'll see these stone niches cut all into the rock. And they would literally carry around the face of their deity and they would maybe do various rituals. They put the face of the deity in the niche that they've, the square niche they've carved into the rock and they would um, worship their deity. So there's something I found really interesting about that when, you know, when you compare this to the cuneiform. So um, I'm just going to remind the viewers of a few things. Remember the name Allah Literally, it's it literally means oh, it, it, the vowels are lied, right? So it's Allah. So it's Allah means the God. That's all it means. It just means the God. So when you look at remember that Pegasus Square we've been looking at the one that sometimes served as a field, sometimes served as an ark, sometimes served as the Garden of Eden. Well, that square, remember it's it's cuneiform astroglyph was Lagab. It's that square cuneiform sign, right? Well, Lagab is equated with the word celestial tablet. It literally can be read Mu-Le'u, which means star tablet or celestial tablet. The same cuneiform signs can be read A, which means to name, and it also means the verb, it's, well, we'd call it a gerund or a verbal noun, reciting. So it's literally, literally a celestial tablet named reciting. And that's what the Quran is. It's a celestial tablet preserved in heb heaven. And Al-Quran means the reciting, the recital. That's what it is. Muhammad is reciting what he's been taught. So that's up there in this in the uh, pagan cuneiform star atlases in the form of Pegasus. But one of the other more intriguing things, Pegasus is, is defined as U Ilu. Remember in ancient cuneiform, this square was a field, which can be read U, right? But it's equated with the word God, which is Ilu in uh, Babylonian. So literally what that says is the Pegasus square is the God. Pegasus square is Allah. And I, it made me wonder if all those square niches you see in pre-Islamic uh, Arabia, the, they, they call them bait els, these niches. They are literally square niches cut into the rock. So you could put the face of the God in there and they're usually rectilinear or square. And I'm wondering if that's what all this is based on. If Salman, Persian, taught Muhammad that, hey, the Quran is based on this celestial tablet that I'm teaching you from the sky. And he just tutors all of this information to Muhammad. And Muhammad goes on to recite this as his Quran, as his recital. So anyway, that's the celestial code of scripture. That was the sampler. It's, it's a long book. I just tried to hit the highlights. I hope that was sufficient for the audience. And I wasn't too pedantic or boring. I try to be as exciting as I can be, but I'm not the... You know what I mean? Like, a, like I'm not a court jester, you know? <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much. That is a very interesting way of, of viewing all of this. I've never heard anything like that. So first thing, let's get this out of the way. I really want everybody to consider uh, going to Amazon down in the description and get you a copy. So if you're interested in looking at the underlying myths and see if there is something there, uh, I would really go check out Dr. McHugh's uh, book, really. It's, it's a really important uh, book to look into if you're interested in this this particular topic. Now, um, that'll be down in the description, so I highly recommend you go do that. I have some questions as yeah. we've gone that I – I mean, look, I really – let me tell you, I'll be very transparent, right? I think that these ancient stories that you're talking about absolutely makes the most sense that Genesis – uh, the flood narratives, everything is coming straight out of a Babylonian context. They're probably in exile at this point, I would think, when they're actually writing Genesis. And so they know 
what you're describing makes so much sense. I have a, a really good friend, Dr. Joshua Bowen, that I definitely want to get this over to because he actually knows Akkadian, Sumerian. He knows the languages, which means you'll be speaking his language and he'll be able yeah. to like go, oh, that's an interesting thing. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to go through some of my personal questions that I had and see what yeah. your thoughts are. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent parallelomania? For example, um, you'll say like it could mean this. And, and that's because there's so many ways to read these things. Yeah. How do we know that that is the way that they read them? You, you know, it's funny. You nailed right on it there. Um, that That is the that's one of the reasons why scholars haven't delved into this. You know, they, they want to, they want to delve into testable theories. Like you can, you can delve into like the origin of horoscopic astrology. Like you can, you can nail that down specifically using texts. The, the only, my only argument is I just try to give example after example, after example to say there's this phenomenon and this phenomenon is the practice of using the starry sky as constellation writing, this constellation writing as a pictographic text that frames scenes from, from monumental history and recording it using puns. And they're, they're not, it's not testable. Uh, it's, if you look at, uh, here's, a, here's where I go into in the book and I didn't mention it in the presentation. So Enuma Elish, Tablet 7, so Enuma Elish is the Babylonian creation story. And Tablet 7, they name the 50 epithets for Marduk, the planet god Marduk. He's the, he's the god embedded in the, the planet Jupiter. They give 50 Sumerian titles for him. Mm -hmm. And then they just break apart the cuneiform signs and render that. They put it in coherent sentences, and that becomes... Uh, revelations about aspects of his power. The entire, I, I think it's 163 lines in Tablet 7 are literally based on wordplay embedded in the 50 epithets right. for Marduk. That's the, the, most pr the most prominent example, the best prototype I can use. And it, you can't figure out why they they chose this word over that word. Why did they omit that word and keep this one? Again, that is the weakness of my argument. I Right. So you're a pioneer yeah. in a sense on yeah. this experiment of yeah. trying to un, un decode potentially uh, some astrological aspect linguistically from this ancient language. Yeah. And um, that's why I'd love to pitch it to some of my friends. And, and the other question I had, and this is in the same vein, so we'll get the criticisms out of the way and then get some of the ideas. One of the criticisms I'd like to ask is, yeah. it's always good to ask a scholar, yeah. what are some of the criticisms that you have received from your peers? Have you had anyone say, no, it's not that you don't know the language. Of course you know the language. It's Maybe they think you're connecting dots too much, or yeah. is there is there any criticism that someone has actually done of your work? Yeah, so you know, a lot of I do have several articles that have gone through, like Jesus Seawalk. Um, you know, they've gone through peer review, so I've got several of the articles have have made it through peer review. So again, I get that same comment you just made. Right. Well, again, one of the reasons people have never asked the questions is because you can't set up a testable argument. W what I'm saying, Derek, I'm saying that maybe, like, you can play paleopsychologist and think like an ancient myth writer. That's right. what I'm saying. And um, you're, a typical scholar teaching at a university would say, nah, I, I'm not even going to tiptoe on that. that. I can't prove that. Therefore, it won't get published. Therefore, I won't even look at it. And what I'm saying, maybe you can. And let, let's, I, I don't think, let's just say, for the sake of argument, half of what I've presented in the book is, is inaccurate. Right. That means half of it's right in a seminal realm of study, a seminal right. discipline. Do you see what I'm saying? So, oh, yeah. so, so maybe someone else will come, on, come along and say, hey, he missed this. But but there's something really valid here. Look at this, and let's go down this route. He he could have he could have gone in this direction. And again, I'm open to criticism. And the criticism I get from people is 
this isn't the kind of stuff that is very testable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I could see that. But, you know, mm -hmm. I actually follow in line with what – so um, Argo and, and dealing with Jonah and the Swallow, yeah. like all of these things seem more plausible – as celestial than than other things um you know and even granting maybe maybe they maybe there were things that happened in real life uh in some aspect in history for people on earth and they saw this as a reflection potentially of something like i've yeah. heard you made a mention and and we'll get into some details here you made mention that the flood is not mentioned in the third millennium but then it finds its way in the second millennium getting yeah. mentioned and the king's list and stuff and some will say, well, there was never really a flood here. They yeah. found this in heaven, um, even though there are wetlands in ancient yeah. Sumerian regions and stuff. So there's the idea that ro water rises. Maybe they saw this flood and, and said, well, there's a celestial aspect as to why what we talked about with oral people – Mm -hmm. With uh, John Knight Lunwell's uh, work, which I love so much in the way he thinks, yeah. is that they connected things that didn't really connect. So here we have a flood on Earth. Maybe there's something in heaven that connects yeah. to that, you know? Yeah, and and maybe maybe there was a regional flood that the the Akkadian speaking people the the Sumer there is a Sumerian flood story, but it's written in about 1600 BC, and mm -hmm. it's written by Akkadian speaking people. For, Probably by the time the Sumerian flood story is recorded, it's it's actually um, based on the older Babylonian flood story. Remember, Sumerian was retained as a, a sacred language right. by those Akkadian speakers. But that doesn't mean there wasn't a regional. I'm not. The, the one argument is that in prehistoric Mesopotamia, there was a great flood that was projected as a, onto the constellations as a memory aid. That's mm -hmm. how they remembered it, and. For whatever reason, the Sumerians didn't write it down, but the Akkadian-speaking people did, and then they incorporated it into their own writings. That's certainly one plausible explanation. I, yeah, I, yeah. Know. This is this this is very interesting. So, yeah. so another thing you brought up was the whole Garden of Eden connection yeah. and the celestial. And one aspect I wanted to mention is there are scholars that I interview who point out in Babylon there were real gardens that had fruit in them that were reserved for the gods. And so I wonder if there is a reflective message again, sacred things on earth, very important things on earth, what people would attribute maybe omens to or something, you know, that is very sacred, like temples. Temples probably find themselves not only on earth, but potentially in heaven. And so I wonder if yeah. the garden story has real vis verisimilitude to the Babylonians on earth as you would maybe look at the constellations yeah i i certainly that that's certainly very possible they they use the term asaku uh, which means forbidden for the words you just described it's it's certain foods are forbidden because they're for the gods or for the king who right. was considered a deity on earth you know or or the queen um and yeah that that certainly could could be what it's based on as well. But what I found interesting is it does have a direct correlate in the in the constellation of that uh, Pegasus Square constellation we were talking about. Right. It that that constellation it, it it's got all this. It's the cuneiform sign's name is gone, but but it can be read Ashog, and Ashog is it's a homonym for this Sumerian logogram that means forbidden, taboo. Yeah. So that's where I was getting it from. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Another yeah. thing you brought up that I thought was interesting was how you said in Jonah's uh, depiction in the Greek, you have this wolf dog headed serpent. And it made yeah. me think of the Egyptian hieroglyphics as well, where there's constantly these half human, half animal or mixed animals that yeah. aren't all one animal. And like, of course, you're not going to find someone might try to go. No, uh, they're going to try and find a literal species of some creature that has that in, the, in yeah. the ocean. It's like, no, stop while you're ahead of yourself. Look at the hieroglyphics that we're finding in Egypt. The influence yeah. in the east, the Near East is all mm -hmm. over this stuff. Yeah. And I wonder if these are constellation examples as well, like potentially significant mythological motifs that are finding themselves in constellations or some heavenly pictures. Yeah, and and you know again, my skill set isn't Egyptian, right? But um, but I, 
but that would make perfect sense. I mean, when I think especially of of the the pyramids and the pyramid texts, which are you know they're often relating how to get to the heavens. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? They're telling you this is how you safely get to heaven. Um, I the Greeks have a term for it as well. It's called katastrism, which means placing amongst the stars. It's a synonym for de deification. Mm -hmm. You, if you were placed in the stars, you just became a deity. Congratulations, you know. <laughs> and uh, you know, so I again, I come back to the, the Our Father prayer. You know, like on earth as it is in heaven, and I really believe that's what everybody was trying to do. And I mean, yeah. Native Americans, Egyptians, Babylonians, Sumerians, uh, Hebrews. You, you know. Uh, you know, Canaanites, you name it. Yeah, I'm with you. I think there's definitely something there. Um, I just wonder how far do we push it? Because this is going to get into another one of my my questions, right? So yeah. the Greek is written in, in uh, the New Testament is written in Greek, a uh, Koine Greek. You have a, yeah. a little more developed. It's a little down the road. And I kind of yeah. wonder if we take a diachronic method here, approaching what you're suggesting, do they really know, are they... Are they really aware of these motifs? Like some of the scholars I talk to, right? They'll look at the Samson example and they'll go, ah, bingo, right on, little son. The, the narrative kind of tells you a little bit yeah. more. Uh, if you get the seven locks, the seven days of the week, yeah. his hair, his rays, mm -hmm. his light, cut it off. Next thing you know, his eyes are being gouged out, which is maybe an indication that the little son is going into winter solstice which might be why there's yeah. darkness. He cannot see. So you might get the hint. And once again, is this provable? Probably mm -hmm. not. But you can look at it and get the gist and say, yes. a thousand men, jawbone of an ass. Now that I'm a Catholic, I could say this and I'm not uh, going to get in trouble. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love yeah. that part. My yeah. point is, is they will grant that the Hebrew Bible and in and, and antiquity are most likely aware of these motifs. But then yeah. when you get into the New Testament, they'll look at this stuff and say, maybe they've lost the element of understanding this as the celestial code and are writing mm -hmm. these motifs the way the ancients may have understood them, uh, being that literature has become uh, narrated in such a way that they've kind of lost sense yeah. of writing these heavenly codes. And, and the same goes for Arabic, right? Now we're talking yeah. 7th century, which maybe they're in a, a an exclusive area yeah. that's held to these yeah. traditions longer, and they haven't been kind of um, cosmopolitanized by the yeah. Roman. And maybe that's an argument to support what you're saying. But I kind of wonder if the connections in the New Testament, though they reflect ancient mythology, aren't really thinking celestial in the same way that maybe the ancient is. We also see Buddha. The Buddha's walking hmm. on water. Uh, really? Yes, the Buddha yeah. walks on water. One of his disciples walks out like it's a slab of granite. And then hmm. he, he realizes, oh, man, and he starts to sink. Interesting. So Interesting. I kind of wonder if this is celestial. Yeah. See? Interesting. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I don't know. I'm throwing things out there at you. Yeah. No, that's that's very that is fascinating. I I can say that um, you remember you were had mentioned several times that for for instance, Mithraism retained all of its its secrets because it was an it was an oral uh, mystery religion mm -hmm. that was nothing was ever written down. One of the things that the cuneiform scholars continually say when they find puns every time they find a pun, it's you know, secret of the scholar, the uninitiated can't can't know this. You can't share it. Um, or uh, secret of the great gods, the uninitiated cannot be. This cannot be revealed to them. Some variation of that. And and Sumerian, that is a that language dies in 1800 BC, and it's retained because it's one of the it's one of the languages the the Babylonian astrologers are studying. They're studying that into the third century, and there are wow. there are there are actually cuneiform Greek uh, tablets where you see cuneiform on one side, your typical scholarly astrological studies, and on the back is Greek, and it's so the this the idea is there were enclaves that were protecting and preserving this secret sacred celestial writing, if you will, and I really. 
I really got to believe that Muhammad had it revealed to him by Salman. Muhammad's a quirky guy, man. He's a quirky figure. He's remarkable, you know, and at the same time, it's so he's so elusive, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, yeah. And the New Testament. I mean, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I love testing in my head uh, these various ideas. You do have a clear cut Magi coming from the East yeah. that are bringing gifts. Um, yeah. It doesn't say three, but, you, you know, people automatically yeah. start connecting the three. Uh, what is it? Orion's belt, right? They always yeah. connect the three. You, you kind of see yeah. the three pyramids at Giza. They're, they're, they, they attribute the kings to being these three. But the point yeah. is, is do they need to know these these secrets um, uh, I, I guess let me put it another way to put it because there's some academics that I've been interviewing like Robin Walsh and I'm trying to connect mm -hmm. academic thinking here mm -hmm. who said that and she's gone on record saying that the writers of the gospels are actually elites okay mm -hmm. they're not they're not like peasant little small time I'm just the only literate guy in the village who's yeah. gonna write this gospel for my little small cult of Christians these are elites, and she believes that they're competing. Each gospel is competing to write a better version. Interesting. And Interesting. she believes they are the one; they are the more sophisticated uh, types. Yeah. Kind of like we have a rewrite of Homer in um, uh, uh, the Roman version, uh, the Aeneid. Yeah. Here you yeah. have Virgil writing Homer's, yeah. you know, for the Romans. And here you have elites that are writing the Gospels. They would have yeah. been aware of this stuff, you think? I I totally agree with the idea that the Gospel authors were elites. You know, I I th this was secret, sacred knowledge. You you had to be chosen to get to be part of the enclave of scholars that were preserving this wisdom. They, they were, it was not for any, you know, just typical scribe on the street. You know, like a tax collector, somebody who's recording, you know, receipts and stuff like that. This was the the best educated scholars in the land, and um, yeah, and I, I do I do believe that the key to help unlock a lot of it is the cuneiform. I do think that you know. So. How do we get the cuneiform and the Greek? You're you're talking about there's connections there yeah. still down into the third, the third century. Yeah, there there are actually Greek and uh, cuneiform Greek uh, texts where the clay tablets where they're writing, they're writing those. Remember I talked about those uh, encyclopedias or um, dictionaries, Sumerian word next to an Akkadian word, it's, it's meaning in Akkadian. Mm -hmm. And then on the back, they'll have the same thing with the Greek word. And so there's somebody sitting down in colloquies, probably secretly doing this. Wow. And it goes into the third century AD. And then it kind of <laughs> ends after the third century. And then, then you've got cities like Edessa in Syria. Syria is a hotbed for all of this stuff, all this paganism. But they're practicing like there's an Akitu festival in um, ancient Babylonia that was like a New Year's festival, if I remember correctly. That's getting practiced in the sixth century AD, according to various, you know, Greek scholars and Christian scholars. So, so this ancient Mesopotamian ritual system and maybe even uh, arcane system of perception perceiving the stars as celestial writing may be getting somehow preserved into the sixth century. You wow. Know, I think I we need to keep our eyes open, right? Yeah, like just to find at least, yeah um, I guess the uh, just to go back, the biggest criticism anyone could have of your work is simply that it's almost, it's, it's not testable the way they want it to be. Yep. Yep. I agree. I, I don't have a, I, I don't have a defense. My only defense is, look at Tablet 7. There's a guy named uh, Jean Botero, um, a fantastic world-class cuneiform scholar who analyzes uh, that Tablet 7 of Enuma Elish and really shows that, that every single cuneiform sign in the 50 epithets for Marduk, the planet god Marduk, 
Jupiter, um, every word from the text is based on a wordplay embedded mm -hmm. in his name, these epithets. Deities names revealed profound uh, aspects of their strength. But again, it's connecting the idea of a name or a word um, being its essence. You know, my name's John, your name's Derek, and we don't think of that as our essence. We think of what we do and, you know, how people know us and that kind of stuff. In the ancient world, our name had a meaning and it revealed a truth about who we are as human beings. Right, right. I know uh, people have showed me over the years, my name means the path. Derek oh, really? yeah. means the path in Hebrew. Uh, there's a couple of kings that were named this, and it's the leader of the way or leader, something like that. Yeah. But yeah, so so I kind of sometimes wonder if this is destiny. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but uh, seriously. That's the podcast. Yeah. You know, John, this is really interesting. I got one more question. And yeah. then what I'd love to do is have people get the book. Tell us what you think down in the comment section, whether you have criticisms, whether you see something. I hope you're at least – floating the ideas in your mind, especially if you go in the ancient world, uh, I could see more red flags for people's heads, probably trying to like figure out how does this connect to the gospels. Then there's some people who will find connections where, in my opinion, there are no connections. They just kind of yeah. find connections. That's where that parallelomania stuff would come up for some folks. And sure. I'm talking about you. I'm talking about people in the chat. I get a lot of that all the time. Yeah. And I get it. How, I... how does Dr. John Knight Lunwall, what is his thoughts of the work? Well, his criticism is exactly what you just said. It's not testable. I can present example. I, you know, I tried to present that golden fleece one because it's so starkly visible in the cuneiform signs. Like there is no way there was a golden fleeced flying ram that carried a kid named Curly and a, and a girl named Helle. And then Helle fell off. That didn't happen. Yeah. However, it's embedded as wordplay in the cuneiform titles for Aries. So that's where all this really started. And I remember hitting it back in grad school at BYU. I remember, BYU is a, I don't want to say fundamentalist church, but it's a Mormon, it's the Mormon church. Yeah. So the Bible has to be historically true at that university. And so I had to always say that these stories were depicted on the, the stars and it was retrieved the stars were a mnemonic device for the story you could remember the story in the stars um so that i didn't get kicked out but yeah. um so you know I, I was always tipped on it but i'm way broader thinking than that i i i i'm very pagan i'm very catholic i'm very jewish i'm very <laughs> very whatever comes down the pike i'm hoping right. you know, like whatever you're is you're muslim you're this you're that yeah, 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 yeah. beautiful it's all beautiful to me and uh i, I so it, it all matters to me, and I find all of it beautiful. Um, and so, uh, I, again, I say half of what I do is wrong. Say what half right. of what I said is wrong. It means half of it's right in a whole new discipline. At the very least, discipline. you're saying, if at the very least you're saying, there's something going on here, and we yeah. need to take a, a second look. We need to consider that maybe there's something going on for sure, especially – you know, you do have zodiac signs on the bottom of synagogues. You have them, mm -hmm. obviously, in the Greek world. We know the Phoenicians were doing this as well. We know the Greeks had their hands on it. We know that the Babylonians were doing this. Like, this is stuff that was going on. And, um, you know, how much were they paying attention to the scar stars? And how much did that play a role in their stories? I can't imagine that they didn't play a role. I imagine they yeah. did. And this is something worth investigating further any final words you'd like to make no i just wanted to thank you for having me on the podcast if you ever want to do a deeper dive into some of the specific chapters i, I especially love the uh the seawalk chap chapter because that went through peer review and stuff so that's not like it's some of the chapters that i wrote about in the book have not gone through academic peer review but that's one of them that has and it's i think it's an ancient uh, ancient, uh, ancient astronomy and uh, uh, astronomy and ancient technologies, archaeoastronomy and ancient technologies. That's the 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 right. web, the, uh, the scholarly journal, and so you know, so I got beat up in you know peer review, and I had to make some modifications and stuff. But but you can literally reconcile the discrepancies in that story from that seawalk tableau, and it's 
jaw dropping to me. Wow. Um, so anyway, I, I just really appreciate the, the the opportunity to be on the show to share my ideas. I look forward to any comments or questions, and um, I hope your um, audience enjoys the book. Thank you so much. Thank I you so much. <laughs> yeah, this has been fun, and I can't wait to do this again sometime, ladies and gentlemen. Don't forget, we are Myth Vision. Thank you.